call at 919-416-1490. Once again, the topic um, that I'm going over this week and we'll go over once again next week is can the NCAA in its current form or can the NCAA reform itself? Basically, in a nutshell, can the NCAA reform itself? Now, let me tell you, and I'm going to defend the NCAA in this um, regard because the NCAA does not run college football. I'm sorry. The NCAA enforces rules against them. Trust me, they enforce it. But as far as the money and control, no. The 1984 uh, lawsuit, the Regents versus the NCAA versus the Regents, I'm sorry left the NCAA with a big major void after they lost that lawsuit. Uh, the television revenue basically goes to um, the NCAA uh, member schools. Conferences, the major conferences run the NCAA football. So trust me, when you hear Oklahoma State and all the other teams that felt like they should have been in the BCS title game, they're, they're arguing against their own schools. They're not, they're making it seem like they're arguing against the NCAA, but no, they're arguing against their own school, their college presidents. The argument should be placed with them and also their, uh, league commissioners because that's who currently runs NCAA football. But what people need to realize is that the recent deal with CBS and Turner Sports, Turner Broadcasting by the NCAA for TV contracts for men's um, or March Madness is what we call it, where they signed that $10.8 billion deal that runs from um, 2011 through 2024, if I'm not mistaken. That brings an average of $771 million to the NCAA per year, per season. That, my friend, is three quarters of a billion dollars built basically on the backs of amateurs on unpaid labor. And that's what really bothers me. That really troubles me. You just imagine a kid coming from humble means and just seeing all this money passing around them and they're not getting any of it. They're not, their scholarship is not even completely paid. paid. You're telling me that this is me talking right here. This is me talking. I think a lot of it is, you know, you got an 18 year old kid and what disgusts me is sometimes the parent of these kids of why they're not bickering about it. You're telling me that I got to come up with $3,000 and y'all got, y'all, good God, y'all just signed a $10.8 billion deal? And my kids still got to pay $3,000? You got to be out your mind. So I do understand. Now you're making my child who, you know, just say for instance, this is even worse. This is like rubbing salt in the wound. I got to say for instance, if I had an 18-year-old kid, seven-footer, they've been recruiting my kid since he's in the seventh or eighth grade, which is foolish. Now you're telling me my kid who's probably pro-ready, seven feet, 250 pounds, nice jumper, dominates the inside, got to go to college for one year. For one year. He going to be about $3,000 short when he could go to the pros and make millions. But now you're telling me that he has to go to college. Help fund your university. We still in the poll house. And by the way, I still got to come up with $3,000. Now, that isn't hypocrisy. I don't know what is. Let's listen to a recent interview with National College Players Association President Ramogi Hema. of about 14,000 football, basketball players, players from other sports uh, across Division One, and um, uh, 7,000 members are current players, 7,000 former, and uh, we're really the only voice for college athletes out there, and um, we've been um, really fighting for, for changes so that college athletes have basic protections. Now listen to Ramogi's input on how the players should be compensated. Uh, 
prohibited players from uh, pursuing commercial opportunities. And that's why you didn't see the scandals in the Olympics. Well, the NCAA's model, a very self-serving model, actually tries to keep players away from any kind of free market value at all, at which point it just puts so much pressure on the system. Um, it's not sustainable. You can see scandals pop up. So uh, the final suggestion is, is that players be allowed to, to pursue commercial uh, endeavors, such as autograph signings, paid endorsements, things of that nature. The guys at Ohio State, um, under, and under that particular model, wouldn't have violated any rules. There would have been no scandals. Even most of the Miami uh, issue, although those are some of the most egregious things that have happened. But even those issues wouldn't have been violations. They would have, they would have been uh, not against the law or NJ rules. Now, the joint report recommends the U.S. Department of Justice and Congress act to bring forth comprehensive reform through NCAA or NCAA deregulation and more educational support for college athletes. Now, going back to um, what Huma stated is alleviating some of his recommendations, of course, is alleviating some athletes' financial desperation by using new TV revenues to provide athletic scholarships that fully cover each school's cost of attendance. And the key word there he's using is new. Um, the NCAA, a lot of college presidents are rejecting a lot of these ideas by Huma and the NCPA. But he's stating new TV revenues. Uh, the new TV revenues that are coming from the $10.8 billion agreements or the contract that the NCAA have signed with Turner Sports, Turner Broadcast, and the CBS. And also the new deals that the leagues, the not the league, but the FBS schools themselves, major conferences have signed with TV contracts, uh, TV networks themselves literally into the millions and millions of dollars. So this is new revenue that he's talking about, not existing revenue. This is new revenue re revenue that hasn't even been budgeted yet. Um, also, one thing, I don't necessarily agree with the, the Olympic amateur model. I would have to see more details in reference to that. I think you, it's a catch-22 when you start uh, lifting restrictions on athletes' commercial opportunities, for example, endorsements and autograph signings. I, I'm really leery, I'm really leery about that one. I would have to have that explained to me a little more, a little more, uh, more in detail. I think you can run into problems with that, um, that one right there. Um, one thing I truly, truly, truly like and would support a hundred percent is allow revenue producing athletes. Uh, when I'm saying revenue producing athletes, I'm talking about the football players and basketball players. Those are the money makers. To receive a portion of new revenues that can be placed in an educational lockbox. This, in turn, is a trust fund, like he explained, a trust fund to be accessed to assist in or upon the completion of their college degree. Players who violate NCAA rules could lose some of all their portion, or all of their portion, excuse me, from this fund. Basically, this will be a great deterrent. A great deterrent to ward off the black market. And I explained what the black market is. I think this is a great plan. Let's say, for instance, I'm a 21-year-old kid and somebody start coming to offer me money, a booster or an agent or whoever, start offering me large sums of money or other items of great value that's very tempting to me. But now, with this in place, I could say, you know what, I'm looking at the big picture. You might front me a few thousand or whatever for this car or whatever. You might front me a few thousand for it, but you know what, I'm looking at the big picture now. Now that I have thousands you know, sitting in a lockbox, an educational lockbox for me. If I graduate, that money's coming with no strings attached. The only string attached is I get it when I graduate. And if I happen to not graduate, then this money's there where I can use the access that I can access to further my education to keep, you know, to keep going towards my degree, my objectives to get a degree. So I like that one. I really like it. It would really, that one right there, in my opinion, would really cut back a lot of this, um, these scandals, a lot of it. And going back to that, going back to Mark Emmert, the NCAA uh, president, he did put on the table back in October. He want to allow multi-year athletic scholarships rather than the one-year renewable awards. And that's why I said earlier that even though the Agnew lawsuit was dropped or dismissed with prejudice, 
something good has come out of that one because now Emma looking and you know because some other athletes trust me will bring it up and could present it right it could be right back in their face in another year or two or, or rather in a month so he's willing to deal with that right now and he's um uh, and he's suggesting multi-year athletic scholarships and there's already schools and especially in the southeastern conference that i'm heard of and read about nothing really confirmed but a lot of recruiters especially football recruiters are using that as a bargaining tool now to get athletes which is getting a lot of objections but i think it's a good thing they're offering the four-year scholarships as a bargaining chip to get some of these players to their school now there's a vote going on this week online voting which i think stops friday with the fbs schools or rather the NCAA in regards to the schools in general, Division One schools, have to do online voting to see if they agree or would like it or oppose it. But also, one thing that bothers me is I think in the long run that will pass, even though it's getting resistance from a lot of FCS schools, and rightfully so, because those schools have smaller budgets and can no way compete with the bigger schools when it comes to money or any type of bargaining with um, recruits, high school recruits. Now, on December the 15th, that really disturbed me is the NCAA suspended plans to give athletes. Another thing that Mark Emmett put on the board is to allow an additional $2,000 stipend for living costs not covered by scholarships. Now, as of today, at least 125 schools um, have already objected to that one. Now, the higher number of protests allows the organization to immediately put that particular change on hold, which I hate that one. I, I, that one really disturbs me. Now, once again, you're going to get a lot of resistance, of course, from your smaller FCS schools, of course, because they just don't have the budget to handle that. And now next week, we will go more into details into can the NCAA or the NCAA, like a lot of people like to call it, reform itself. So please be sure to tune in next week as we go uh, once again over can the NCAA reform itself. Also, we'll go more in detail the dollar figures that the NCPA is uh, suggesting that um, the NCAA and colleges should put towards um, with new revenue towards funding um, for the educational lockbox and uh, education, the educational lockbox. And this would also include uh, sports that will be covered under the Women's Title IX um, Act. So don't think the females are being kept out of this at all. So uh, it will include um, agreements under Title IX to be in compliance with that um, title, with the Title IX Act uh, for female sports um, to be included as well. So please definitely make sure you tune in next week at the same time as 7.30 on Power 750 WAUG. And online at power750.com. Also, please keep in mind that the Babe Tom Herman Show is sponsored by E A Natural Skin Care Studio located on 711 Iredell Street in Durham, North Carolina. Contact Eugenia at 919-416-1490 to make your manicure, pedicure, or facial appointment. Be sure once again to give her a call at 919-416-1490. Thank you once again for tuning in. On today's broadcast of the Babe Tom Herman Show, have a great weekend, and most of all, have a Babe Tom Herman kind of week. You have been listening to the Babe Tom Herman Show on Power 750 AM Radio WAUG and on Power750.com.